you study and you have experience and you have uh, experience. We will be hosting Bible study for the next day, so you know what will happen. But, uh, so, I thank God for this opportunity to be in front of you, and uh, to be your teacher for the Supreme Master today. So, we will not be reading the whole chapter of the second Corinthians chapter 11, but uh, the chapter in the world of the day. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to strengthen our faith in you, Father God. The Holy Spirit will help us and be able to say all the words that are appropriate for you all of them to be able to write. For the hiding behind the cross and the Holy Spirit will be our teacher for the day. All these things you pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you have your Bibles with you? Amen. This is a Dominic class, so we must uh, have our Bible. This is our armor. So our topic for today, for today is the evidences of Father Bilal. We see in this chapter that Paul compared himself as a spiritual father, caring for his health, for his family. Uh, by the way, who are, uh, are who are who is a father here? Most of the men are fathers. Okay? So Paul compared himself as a spiritual father caring for his family. He had used this image to remind the Corinthians that as a father, he had begotten them through the gospel. So Apostle Paul is a spiritual father to the Corinthian believers. Uh, as we all know, uh, how proud the Apostle Paul is. To be uh, to Timothy, he called Timothy my own son in the faith. So, as a father, have you experienced uh, being a spiritual father? Or have you shared somebody in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to somebody? Paul, uh, he said to Timothy, my own son, even to Titus, my own son in the common faith. So, <coughs> That he, uh, Paul said that he could discipline them if he felt it was necessary. So being the spiritual father of the church of Corinth, he has the responsibility to, to uh, discipline the believers. Okay? Even in BBC, our spiritual father is rather than Pastor John. So if the church is uh, doing something wrong, then he has the responsibility to discipline the members. Amen? Why? Because Paul, he considered the believers in Corinth, they were his beloved children. And he wanted the very best for them. Of course, being a father, if you are a father, you want the very best for your children. Amen? No father uh, don't want the, the worst thing that uh, he can give to his children. But he wants to give the very best for, for them. So Paul gave three evidences of fatherly love for them. Number one, number one is his jealousy over the church. His jealousy over the church. The picture here is that of a loving father who has a daughter engaged to be married. He feels it is his duty to keep her pure so that he can present her to her husband with joy and not with sorrow. So the church is the, the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. So Paul is picturing Uh, he, he wants the church to be uh, to be pure so that he can present it to her husband with joy and not with sorrow. So Paul wants the believers to be pure as she prepares to meet the Lord. Ephesians 5.22 
He wants every believer to be pure as He prepares to be the Lord. Ephesians 5, 22. 27. That He might present it to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church, and gave Himself for it, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So this this should be our life before the Lord, that we should be pure and holy. Uh, this is uh, uh, to the wives. And in uh, Romans chapter 7 verse 4, Romans 7 verse 4 Wherefore my brethren, he also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that he should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So the Lord is holy, he is holy. So how can we uh, be married to him if we are not holy? So Paul is telling the believers to be pure before before the Lord. And uh, you know there will be a marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 19 verse 1 to 9. That uh, we'll be married to the one who created us when we will get to heaven. So there's a marriage supper of the Lamb. Letter B is the peril was Satan using counterfeit ministers who pretend to serve God but who are really the servants of Satan. We can find it in our text. In verse uh, 13 to 15, it says that for such are false prophets of for, for such are false apostles deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose ends shall be according to their works. So, Satan is, has a minister also, but it is a counterfeit. It's not original. Amen? Amen. Satan has also a counterfeit gospel. If he, there is a counterfeit minister, there is a counterfeit gospel. We can find that in Galatians 1, 6 12. says here, I marvel that you are soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an, or we or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said, Paul is telling, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that he have received, let him be a curse. So we need to know the gospel, which, what is the gospel. Amen. And we, we need to defend the gospel as well. Amen. Amen. If you are a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, the first thing that you must know and we, you can defend is the gospel. Amen. Amen. Because if you will be uh, taught by eh, uh, another gospel, then your faith will be tossed to and fro. Mm -hmm. You will believe another gospel. So, that's the very Satan is a counterfeit minister and there is a counterfeit gospel. Unfortunately, the Corinthians had welcomed this new gospel, which is a mixture of law and grace. We, 
the law has got uh, passed and we are living now by grace. We are now living by grace. So that's let it be the bed and see the preachers of this new gospel. The preachers of this new gospel are described in 2 Corinthians 11, chapter 11, verse 13 to 15. As I had uh, read a while ago. That they are impostor, impostors. They are impostors. No, if we can, if we encounter this kind of doctrine, what we need to do? What we need to do as believers? In Romans 16, 17, it says there that we need to avoid them. We need to avoid them. In 2 John, chapters, uh, 2 John 7 to 11, that we should not deceive them and beat them God's faith. So, if you are not rooted in, in the doctrine, then you will be uh, maybe believe, believe in this uh, new gospel that others are, are uh, teaching. So we need, we need to be rooted in the Word of God. Paul proved his love for the church by protecting it from the attack of false teachers and expose them. So every member of the Real Baptist Church has a responsibility. We have a responsibility to protect the church. Yes. Of course, we are visitors are coming, uh, other people are coming in the, in the church, and they will bring another doctrine. So if we are not careful, we might be uh, uh, divided because of this uh, new doctrine. It will allow them to come in, inside the church and penetrate in, inside the church. So uh, Paul proved his love by protecting it from the attack of the false teachers and exposing them. Amen? So that's number one, his jealousy over the church. Number two is his generosity to the church. How come the Apostle Paul became generous to the Corinthian church? In verse 7 to 12, it says here, Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that she might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? Paul said, Did I commit a violation in preaching to you the gospel freely? I rob other churches, taking wages of them to do your service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied, and in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you. And so I will keep myself. And so on and so forth. So Paul had sacrificed that he might minister to the church of Corinth. He labored with his own hands. Acts, uh, let's see it in Acts 18, 1 to 3. How Paul sacrificed for the church of Corinth. After the things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Portus. Lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same crop, he abode with them and wrote, for by their occupation they were dead makers. So Paul had sacrificed that he might minister to the church of Corinth. He also received gifts from other churches so that he might evangelize Corinth. So could you imagine the church at Corinth is very, uh, all the members are very wealthy. This is a wealthy church. But uh, the support is from outside the church. It's not, it's not from the church at Corinth itself. So that's why Paul is using these gifts for Paul to minister to the church at Corinth. 
it had cost the Corinthian church nothing. They spent nothing. In verse 8 to 9, Of uh, our text, I love other churches, taking wages of them to do your service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man, for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. <coughs> Could you imagine all this ministry to the church at Corey. But it's the other churches who is giving the support to the Apostle Paul, to minister to the church at Corey. How is that? Is that the right thing for the church to do? To the man of God? Yet the Corinthians did not appreciate the sacrifices that Paul made for them. They were so ungrateful. They were so ungrateful to the men of God. I believe and I hope and pray that it will not happen to our church in the BBC. If that will happen, how Pastor John will be more? How would he be? Right? If BBC members are ungrateful for the sacrifices that Pastor John is sacrificing for the church. We need to be uh, grateful that God has given us a pastor. Okay? A pastor. You know? On the other hand, it was the Judaizers who were guilty of peddling the gospel for personal profit. Uh, when I was new in the faith, I experienced this. Uh, uh, I didn't know that uh, so called Christians they are coming to your house, they sit in your house. And they are giving some reading materials. And when they hand it to you the materials, donation of white on reading materials here. And at that time I don't I cannot defend the faith that I have because I was new to faith. So if this will happen to us, what do we do? What would you do? Will you uh, be believing them? Or will you be joining them? So, it's not, their purpose is not for the ministry. For the growth of the ministry, but for ministry. That's what I asked Master John about. What's that? They pending the gospel. Their purpose is to get money from, from people. So that, that is ministry. Ministry. Uh, it's a new, new vocabulary. So they're peddling the gospel, the Judaizers. But Paul had freely preached the gospel to them. Paul had freely preached the gospel. Paul did not ask money for, for them in preaching the gospel. That is not his intention. Paul had already explained his policy in, in a previous letter. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, let's uh, go to this one. First Corinthians chapter 9, this is the highlight of the lesson for the First First Corinthians chapter 9. Should we muscle the ox that threaded off the port? It says in this chapter. In verse 9, for it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muscle the ox the mouth of the ox that threaded out of horn, that God take care of for oxen. You know, we've uh, learned to give in, in, in this church. Everybody has a struggle when it comes to giving. I myself struggle uh, when it comes to giving, when Pastor John came to BBC. Me and my wife uh, Talk about about giving our lives. Um, first, I I myself have been the husband. Of course, I'm not very big at that level. We talk about it. First, I agree with uh, giving the lives, but then my wife still uh, she needs to observe. 
And then, from time to time, Pastor John is uh, always explaining about giving, about giving. Then I, love, I learned to love giving. I learned to love giving. And then my wife, uh, Billy, also. Amen. So it's a great, great uh, lesson that we learned from Pastor John about uh, giving. And then, uh, of course, it's very hard if uh, you have a family gift and then you give give your price and it affects your budget. It affects your budget. But uh, the Lord is not uh, uh, not considering his brothers. He is always blessing us. Uh, we cannot talk with God. Right. We, we cannot talk with God. So, I believe when we give, we should not have the uh, heart, uh, heart to, uh, to us the church, whether where is the money going, right? Right? We should we should not have that part. If you have a problem with that, then your giving is not uh, uh, right with God, because we don't have the right when we give, but belongs to God. We don't have the right to to ask where the money goes, because we know the ministry of the church. So. BBC has a big ministry. Ministry. And it should be our pastor who, who can decide where, where the money goes. Okay. Yeah. Not us. Because he is our spiritual father. Yeah. He's our spiritual father. So uh, we are blessed because we have a father who, uh, who is very generous. Yeah. Everybody knows. You experience uh, how Pastor John gives. It's a blessing. It's really a blessing. Uh, I hope that every spiritual father or every pastor of the church is like our pastor. Amen. 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 I'm not getting Pastor John, but we can see his life. We can see his life. But you know, Paul is a different experience that Paul can experience to the church at Corinth. He gave up the right of being supported that, so that nobody could accuse, accuse him of using the gospel as a means to make money. They accused him, Paul, you are here because of, of, uh, because of money. It's very hard on the part of uh, Apostle Paul, right? It's very hard. So, a loving father does not lay his burdens, burdens on his children. Instead, he sacrifices so that the children might have what they need. Amen. So that the children might have what they need. Paul did not bring, bring up this mother of money in order to boast of himself. He used it to silence the boasting of the Judaizers. He proved his love to the Corinthians by his generosity. He gave so much sacrifice, so much, and so much sacrifice for them. So that's the second one. You see, Paul's, Apostle Paul's generosity to, to the church. And number three is, is anxiety for the church. Anxiety means fear. Fear about what might happen to, to the church. In verse 16 to 23, we can find it here. The key to this long section is in verse 28. Verse 28. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Paul was saying that he had many trials, but the heaviest is his concern for the church. You know, some pastors, they don't, they don't have concern for the church. I, I believe, you know, some churches, uh, they are only after, uh, after uh, what they can get from the church. But Paul, he really, he has really a care and concern for, for the church. The word 
translated care means pressure, stress, anxiety. His concern for the churches is the greatest trial of all. It's the greatest trial of all. You know, having a family is, uh, is a very challenging one. But how much more in the church? It's a purpose of many believers. It is a great, but a great body, a great family. But it is Maybe yes, is his concern for the family. But The other experience were stillness, external and occasional, but the burden of the churches was internal and constant. You know, church is, uh, church without uh, burden is not a church. Right? It's not a church. We are experiencing so many trials in now, for now. Some are experiencing uh, problems at work, some is, uh, is no work. But if you want to work, you come to me. Uh, I'm hiring. Right line, right line. Happy birthday. So, the burden of the churches was internal and constant. Uh, some are external, of course. Uh, and occasional, but most of the time is internal. Paul enumerated his experience to prove his love for the Corinthians and protect them from those who would lead them astray. In verse 20, we see a list of various ways the Judaizers had taken advantage of the church. Verse 20, it says here, for he suffered, if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. So we see the, the word bondage, devour, take of you, exalt, smite you. These are the uh, uh, the various ways that the Judaizers had taken advantage to the church. They were simply selfish. They were simply selfish. Let us see Paul endured sufferings for Christ. In verse 23 to 25, we can see all the sufferings that the Apostle Paul had experienced in his ministry, in his, his life. There, are, there is a natural hardship, hardship in verse 25 to 33, it is being, being enumerated there. Paul endured all of the sufferings for one purpose, and the, that purpose is for the cause of Christ. Amen. And the care of, for the care of the churches. He endured all those sufferings. So, what sufferings are we suffering right now? Our work? It's just uh, not even a part of what Apostle Paul has experienced. But how can we endure those sufferings in our life? But Paul endured it all for the cause of Christ and for the churches. Paul endured all this because of his love for Christ and the church. Second Corinthians. 12.15 Ito, ginagamit ito ng mga mamiligod, mga ginata. And I will very clear that he spent, spent and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I love you. So, Paul enjoyed all those, all this because of his love for, for the Lord and for the church. As a conclusion, we cannot read these verses without admiring the courage and devotion of the Apostle Paul. Paul said in Acts 20.24, Acts 20.24, it says there, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, 
so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received from the Lord, of the Lord Jesus, to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. So none of those things that Paul suffered never moved him. Now the church had to prove its love for Paul. How can we prove our love to the man of God, to our pastor? How can we prove our love? We need to support him. We need to pray for him. We need to assist him. We need to love him. May we never take for granted the sacrifices that others have made so that we may enjoy the blessings of the gospel. I hope uh, that we learn something, something from the lesson from today. I will give the time to the question. Thank you so much, Brother Alan. Uh, I hope you learned something. And uh, uh, much of what Brother Alan has uh, said, I think, are uh, things that came from his heart. It's not necessarily the manuscript that I, that I made, but all those are scriptural and biblical. So in this lesson, we see the relationship between the pulpit and the people. The pulpit and the pew, the pulpit and the pastor and the members of the church. Uh, it's a relationship that uh, Satan would always seek to sever. And if there is animosity between the pastor and the, the, the lady, the members, uh, regardless of the lesson, the preaching, the will not have the, the even if it's true, what you're saying. If there is if it is severed by most of these members will no longer be blessed. Okay, that's why this is very, very important. So uh, Paul loves the church very much and he gave us three evidences. Number one he is his what? His jealousy over the church. He was the one who labored, he was the one who worked hard he said, I have begotten you, they got saved because of him. And now came in the false teachers. That's very, very sad. And this, this happens. This happens in, in churches a lot. And so uh, Paul really wants the church to to be pure and so that when they when when they stand before the Lord, it you can never go the apostle for me. Even in First Thessalonians, he said, for what is our joy or crown? Let's look at the verse. Never intend to cure the verse, but uh, uh, First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. You can see this in the letters, in his letters, 18 verse. What for we would have come unto you, even I Paul once and again, but Satan hindered us. You see how Satan hinders what the pastor is trying to do with the members and vice versa. For what is our hope, the Apostle Paul said, or joy, or our crown of rejoicing? What is our joy? What is it that gives us joy in our hearts? Okay? And then he said, Here, are not even ye in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and our joy. The glory and the joy of the pastor is when members stand before the judgment seat of Christ and they give a good accounting of themselves to the Lord. Because they, they live a Christ-like life and they serve the Lord with all their heart and all their mind and strength. So the pastor will, uh, will be so joyful uh, to be able to witness that one. So one is his jealousy for the church and second is his generosity. And I already wrote this in my notes even before Brother Alan noted it. My verse for BBC is exactly verse 15. Okay? I have been checking my Bible. This is my verse when it comes to BBC. But I will be very gladly spent and be spent for you. I will be very gladly spent and be spent for you. Like a candle. You are giving light, but at the same time you are burning. I will be very gladly spent and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I will love. Even if you love me less, by me loving you more, 
Um, I don't, I, I'm not really demanding your love or support or anything like that. That's, it's up to you. My main mission, my responsibility is to love you the way a spiritual leader should, should uh, love the members of the church. Now, money matters. Okay? Brother Adam mentioned something about money. When you give, I'm not trying to investigate where did my money go. If you want, you can. Because we have a church money. Uh, every, every time we have people, honest members who are counting the offering, not just one, not people who are related, okay? And then from time to time we have other people that are joining them. So we have people counting the offering, and then we have, uh, uh, in fact, in our church before, 30 years I've been in the Philippines in the church, and we have a uh, financial meeting twice a week. I'm a member of the financial meeting, so we approve their expenses. Okay, what do we need to spend for? What, what, what should we use the money for? Okay, so we talk about that. You don't just spend the church money without, without the approval of you know, the financial committee and the pastor. Okay? So if you, have, if you need to buy something, get it approved. But here at BB6, you know, uh, we, we, we don't, that's not the way we do it. Okay? Uh, our members, they know uh, what uh, what should they use the money for. For example, we need money for transportation. The yeah. I'm planning to take that responsibility from him. Just okay. 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 He rents the buses, so he pays for the buses. Somebody pays for the rental of the building like every single month. Somebody buys the rice for a church. And so somebody pays for the petrol of the... You know, we just trust everybody. It's a ministry that is built on trust. Okay? Uh, then they don't get approval from me. I just receive the church budget every single week. Are you expenses money? If you want to see it, you're welcome. I can I can show you. Uh, tell me the date. I can, I can give you the date. Okay? If you just ask me, uh, uh, I, can, I can show you every single week what the money was used for. The general fund. Okay? There are two funds in our church. One is the general fund. Our tithes and the uh, love offering that is the no offering that, uh, that is used for the ministry of the local church okay uh prioritize it to the storehouse that there may be need by house the tithes and offerings love offering is for the ministers and the ministry we use it to pay for this building electricity and water we use it for our bible studies we use it for other things okay that's that the, the church needs. Okay, that's the general fund. We also have help the video offering. Our help the video offering goes to the person who, that we uh, that we raise the money for. For example, Brother Stephen is going to Kenya. So we had a special offering last time. The special offering was very small. So I uh, it was not even 200 I think because we divided it. So I just gave Brother Martin 1,200. Uh, but it's still not lucky, so he is raising from our African brothers. So the help the video offering goes to the one who is in game. We just gave Brother Jomar. We gave Brother Joel a lot of offering. He said, Pastor, he's so gracious, he said, I still have a job. Uh, so can you please give the money to Brother Jomar instead? So I gave the money to Brother Jomar uh, for his family. You know, uh, that is uh, 700 something reals plus 6,000 pesos. That was already given to Brother Jomar. Uh, we have the BBL, Building Building to Build Lives. It's Brother Marlon who contacts pastors who are in need. He just sent a pastor uh, some money, 10,000 pesos, to a pastor last week. And uh, you remember the pastor that uh, was mentioned by Brother Arnold? Uh, I think he will be next. They need roofing and flooring for the church. I think we can help them with the roofing. So that BBBL, Building Building to Build Lives. We have had so many churches already. It's a brother Marlon who is sending the money to, the, uh, to those uh, pastors. Uh, what else? What is this in our offering? Uh, missions. The missions money is for the missionaries. Okay? The mission money is for the missionaries. Uh, we do not choose the mission money for our church. We are supporting over 400 now missionaries. Okay? And you know, we cannot do other things. Uh, some churches they have bingo to raise funds. Some they have raffles, some of them they have gimmicks. But we have to understand, 
God has an ordained way how to raise funds in the church. Amen. There is no other way. It is through the tithes and offerings of the church. There are religious groups who will go out and preach in the Philippines and they will collect money in the buses, in the marketplaces. That is not, not, that's not scriptural. Right. Okay. We can sell stuff and other things. But God's ordained way of supporting the David of the church is through the tithes and offerings. Amen. Okay. Do not devise other plans because God has given us a plan Amen. in this world. Okay. And if you are trying to you know, raise some money also, sell some stuff and do this so that you can give more, it's up to you. But we have to understand that there is an ordained, God ordained way of uh, God's way of financing His church. Amen. Okay. Now, uh, the missions money that, that goes to the missionaries, uh, Brother Bong, sex missionaries, I'm not sending them money to the missionaries anymore. Uh, for example, almost 600,000 pesos every single month needs to be sent to the missionaries. And that doesn't include, uh, what do you call this, the emergencies. Like, some missionaries have an emergency, we need to send them some, some help. So that's where, that's where our offering goes. And we have the records. If you want to see the records, it's there. If you want to see how much money you have given to the church, we have the record. Right now, right there, we can show you in the computer how much you have given since you joined BBC. Okay? It's, uh, everything has been accounted for. So just, just in case you want to see. Because there was one time when somebody left the church and his reason was, I was asking for the church budget for a long time, but nobody gave it to me. And my question is, who did you ask? Because nobody asked me. I asked the church, did somebody ask you to see the church budget? Nobody knows. Okay. Be careful with accusations like that one. Okay. We understand that the money you're giving is, you know, you work for it, and the money that, uh, that is given should be uh, used carefully. Uh, the church. Uh, Brother Alan said, should be the pastor. And, okay, I, I, I can do that if I want to. But here, as long as you see, you need to do, you need to purchase something, you need to do this, we need to have a cabinet here, or we need to put the, rather if we see the church on that, you know, it needs to buy the cabinet. If you see something that needs to be done, that needs to be purchased, as long as it's reasonable, go ahead. Okay. It will be good if you will mention it to me, Pastor, I think we will need this. That will be great, or at least one of our deacons. Uh, I, I don't even ask. I, I don't even ask, Brother Jason, why do you spend so much on what is this maintenance for? I don't even go to them, like Brother Ken. I don't even ask them. Uh, because I trust that you know, they use uh, that money to uh, what is reflected. And they have the receipts. Most often we have the receipts also of uh, what we spend the money for. Okay, so. Uh, that's number one, Paul's jealousy over the church, and second is his generosity. Paul was so generous to the church. Uh, he even he has the right. If you will read First Corinthians chapter nine, Paul defended his his right to be supported supported adequately by the church. But he did not, you know, he did not exercise that right. He did not exercise that right. There will be pastors that telling you. They will come to you directly and say, they will say, okay, ten percent. Besides your tithes, there is also a portion of your salary for the pastor. We do not do that here, okay? Uh, if that works for them, then it's their business, not mine. Uh, so we see Paul's jealousy over the church and his generosity to the church and his anxiety, his concern for the church. I don't know, I'm sure you did this, I'm sure you understood what Brother Alan was saying, how he differentiated Paul's concern. Some of the problems in the church are external and occasional. For example, we had some problem here when we took over this villa, but that is occasional. That happened in the eight and one half years that I have been here. That's the first time that happened. It cost us some money, a great sum of money, but that is uh, that uh, that happens external. If the person is not a member of our church, and occasional. It's a one-time thing. So some of the problems of the church are external and they are temporal or they are occasional. They just, they seldom happen. But there are some problems in the church that are internal, it's within and it's constant. You know? It's constant. 
and the pastor has to think about this. Uh, always the care of all the churches. I feel sorry for the apostle Paul. Some some preachers are jealous with big churches. I am not. I feel sorry for the pastor of big churches because I know they have so much problems. Uh, my problems are, you know, of course, the church, the problems of our members of the church, somebody sick in the family. My problems are the problems of all those missionaries like Brother Charles. He needs money for his wife, and he needs it. it uh, it, it was urgent, so I called Brother Martin, Brother Martin came to our house, he ate our food. <laughs> <laughs> he took me to that man, and he charged me double. <laughs> 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 well, right? How much is our fare from our house to that man? He charged me 50. <laughs> Am I right? Did you get 50 yesterday? That is quite times. Nice. It's a okay, huh? <laughs> Because he said I'm special, so he is charging me a special price. <laughs> you know, you're charging him five times what you're doing. Uh, and he did not pay for the food in our house either. <laughs> but uh, he's doing he, he, he came to our house, took the money, and sent it to charge. Okay. Um, so the problems that our missionaries are facing, uh, that's all. Uh, you don't have to be concerned. Uh, so if we have 200 visitors, I have less of a problem than other churches. So, um, thank you for listening so well. Do you have any questions about this lesson? And then we will dismiss. I hope that we will enlighten a little bit about you know, this, this uh, thing. Any questions? You are welcome to us. You are welcome to us. Anybody? No more? By the way, I have good news for everyone. Sister Phoebe was telling me, Zap that same this way. He is five. How old are you now, Zach? How old are you? You're five. That, that's why my name is IQ. You're five. That's his IQ. Yeah. But he is five years old. JD was saying, I think, when he was four. When he was four. Do you understand what salvation was? And I was very happy to be one of the people to salvation of the building. See, if you're smart, you can be saved earlier. I got saved when I was two years old. No, he doesn't. What? This is rather better. I, I blame him. He said, I thought you were 13 or 14 because you are tall. Are you trying to judge the age of a person like that? Right? <laughs> if that is so, then I'm just 18. Okay? <laughs> that means tall people are older. Okay? That is great. Thank you so much, Brother Alan. Thank you. Thank you for the Let's take an offering for Sister Mary. Mary is the wife of Brother Charles.